We light this candle as a symbol of what we are traditionally told that Jesus is the light of the world. And we have this as a reminder for us symbolically throughout our worship time. Um, and in this fashion, this is in the you know, liturgical Christian year, this is the uh, Sunday that is the Sunday before Pentecost Sunday. So next week, the whole shebang will be red, and we have different candles and do that sort of stuff to represent uh, Pentecost. But so we've been in Eastertide time, and since Easter, this candle has been out front instead of on the table. And we do these kind of symbolic things to help us remember and to stimulate. And then if we don't remember, the preacher tells you what it means, and then we remember again. So this is a symbol of Christ, the light of the world, as we are told. But we know in our congregation that we also remember Jesus said in the gospel, you are the light of the world. And so as it has provided and provides illumination and inspiration for us throughout our worship service, it is something that when it is extinguished at the end of worship, the light does not go out. We take that light with us as we go out into the world through the doors. So that is a part of what we have done uh, since the beginning of Bloom in the Desert Ministries. I take the opportunity now to welcome you to Bloom in the Desert Ministries. We are... United Church of Christ and Reconciling Ministries Congregation, we do our best to live up to the motto of the United Church of Christ that says, whoever you are and wherever you are on the journey of faith, you are welcome here. And so we are intentional about expressing our welcome to people knowing that we ourselves come from a wide variety of backgrounds. We come from different economic status. We come from different political persuasions. We come from uh, different geographic regions. We know we come from very different, among the group here, different religious backgrounds, some with none and some with some that have been very rigorous and others uh, uh, that uh, maybe weren't so rigorous, but it still has effect upon our lives in good ways. And so we bring all of that together in the room here, our different ways of believing and understanding. And in such a way, we welcome all who welcome all and we welcome all, understanding that wherever you are on the journey of faith, you are welcome here. We also know that in creation, uh, God's creation is diverse. And so from a standpoint of our understanding and welcome, we are an open and affirming congregation, which means we actively welcome people who are straight and gay, bisexual. We also know that on the realm of gender identity, God's creation is not binary. And we welcome people who are in gender identity transitioning, people who are transgender, people who are gender non-conforming, and people who specifically um, uh, request not to be identified by a specific gender. All of God's creation is welcome with us. Now is the time when we go from being scattered to being gathered. We go from being out there to being here. Let us bring our heart and mind and soul and strength, as people have done for thousands of years, into this, into a space, into this space, for the worship of God. Please rise as you are able. As we gather on Mother's Day, we continue, continue to remember the resurrection story of Jesus. For us, it heralds new life in ways beyond understanding, ways of faith. Show us how to live in love and way be very familiar. Loving our enemies, offering kindness in the face of anger, giving again and again and again to assist people in need. By our worship today, Help us set ourselves loose from national restrictions so we can truly be the people dedicated to song, song, king on, pause, peace, amen. This is the time of our worship when, in faith, we open our hearts to ministry. Let us say a prayer for Mother's Day. Loving God, oh God you entrust women and men with capacities to participate with you in creating children. Today we pray for mothers who gave us their gift of life, for mothers who unconditionally love and nurture their children, for expecting mothers who are wondering and waiting, for mothers who are struggling, for those who want to be mothers 
or had another child, hoping in the time. For mothers to children be ruined in the altar. For mothers to children be ruined in the abundant. For mothers to trying to balance tasks of work and home. For mothers to children be challenged and challenging. For mothers facing children on their own. For mothers who have lost children. For mothers who care for children and other brothers. For mothers, sisters, relatives, and other persons in the act of mothers. Grant your blessing on all the mothers. Help their love be deep and tender. Their care be compassionate and unrefailing. We bless them with our love and appreciation. Eternal source of creation, receive now our silent prayers. To all our silent prayers, let the people say, Amen. 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 Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things endures all things. Love never ends. Amen. Amen. Let us now receive the word. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Our reading from Hebrew scripture today comes from Psalm 97. Yahweh reigns. Let the earth rejoice, let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness surround you, Yahweh. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your judgment seat. Your lightning bolts light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax at your sight, at the sight of the God of all the earth. The heavens proclaim your justice, and all the people see your glory. All who worship images are put to shame, who make their boast in worthless idols. All gods bow down before you. Zion hears and is glad, and the women of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, Yahweh. For you, Yahweh, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Yahweh, you love those who hate evil. Preserve the lives of your faithful ones and deliver them from the hands of the wicked. Light dawns for the just and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in Yahweh, you just, and give praise to God's holy name. Here ends the Hebrew scripture reading. Please rise as you are able for the reading of the Gospel. The Gospel today is from John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26. And as I read this over the first time, I thought back to the days when I was a salesperson for Flores Transworld Delivery, FTE. I would travel around and then I would go back to the main office and I would have a meeting with my sales manager and we would go over things that happened to me and things that he wanted. This sounds like Jesus is in a sales meeting to me. <laughs> <laughs> Today's Gospel comes from uh, John 17th chapter, verses 20 and 26, which I said. Jesus says, I don't pray for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through the message that you, that all may be one as you, Abba, and are in me and I in you. I pray that they may be one in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in unity then the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as you love me. Abba, I ask that those you gave me may be here with me so they can see this glory of mine, which is yours gift to me. Because of this love, 
that you had for me before the foundation of the world, righteous one. The world has not known has known you. But I have, and these people know that you sent me. To them I have revealed your name, and I will continue to reveal it, so that the love that you have for me may live in them just as I may live in them. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Mother's Day, according to Wikipedia, in the United States is an annual holiday celebrated the second Sunday in May. Mother's Day recognizes mothers and motherhood as well as the positive contributions mothers make to society. Although many Mother's Day celebrations worldwide have quite different origins and traditions, most have now been influenced by the more recent American tradition. Established by Anna Jarvis, organized by Jarvis, the first official Mother's Day was celebrated at Andrews Methodist Episcopal Church in Crofton, West Virginia, Grafton, West Virginia, which now holds the International Mother's Day Shrine Previous attempts at establishing Mother's Day in the United States sought to promote peace by means of honoring mothers who, were, who had lost or at risk of losing their sons at war. In its present form, Mother's Day was established by Anna Jarvis with the help of the uh, Philadelphia merchant John Wanmaker. No relation to the Wanmaker Burgers. Following the death of Anna's mother, Anne Jarvis, on May 1905, following the death of Anne's mother, Anna's mother, Anna Jarvis always claimed that the creation of Mother's Day was hers alone, but Anne began the groundwork. The first official Mother's Day service was on May 10, 1905. A small service was held on May 12, 1907 in the Andrews Methodist Episcopal Church in Grafton, where Anna's mother, Anne, had been teaching Sunday school for years. In May 2008, the U.S. House of Representatives voted twice on a resolution commemorating Mother's Day. The Grafton Church, where the first celebration was held, is now the International Mother's Day Shrine and a National Historic Landmark. Jarvis then campaigned to establish Mother's Day first as a U.S. national holiday and later as an international holiday. The holiday was declared officially by the state of West Virginia in 1910, and the rest of the states followed quickly. President Wilson's Mother's Day proclamation was May 9, 1914. In 1934, U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt approved a stamp commemorating the holiday. Traditions on Mother's Day include church going, the distribution of carnations, and family dinners. Mother's Day is the third largest holiday in the United States for sending cards, according to the greeting card industry. It is established that more than 50% of the American households send greeting cards on this holiday. Carnations have come to represent Mother's Day since Anna Jarvis delivered 500 of them at the first celebration in 1908. Many religious services held later adopted the custom of giving away carnations. The founder, Anna Jarvis, chose the carnation because that was her mother's favorite flower. Florists invented the idea of wearing a pink or red carnation if your mother is living, and a white carnation if your mother is deceased. Rev. Kev and Mike Shear generously provided us with carnations today, and after this service, if you'd like, you couldn't get white ones, take a pink one if your mother is deceased and a red one if she's still living after the service. 
The commemoration of the American holiday began very early, and only nine years after the first official Mother's Day, it had become so rampant that Anna Jarvis herself became a major opponent, opponent of what the holiday had become. Spending all of her inherent, inheritance and the rest of her life fighting what she saw as an abuse of this celebration, she described the practice of purchasing greeting cards was not acceptable because people were just too lazy to write their own personal letter. <laughs> she was arrested in 1948 for disturbing disturbing the peace while protesting against the Mother's Day, and she finally said that she wished she would have never started the day because it became so out of control. She died later that year. Mother's Day is now one of the most commercially successful American occasions, having become the most popular day of the year to dine out at a restaurant in the United States and generally a significant portion of the U.S. jewelry industry's annual revenue from custom gifts like mother's rings, spa treatments. The Americans spend approximately 2.6 billion dollars on flowers, 1.53 billion dollars on pampering gifts, and another 68 million on greeting cards. Let's remember Mother's Day recognizes mothers and motherhood, as well as the positive contributions mothers make to society. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. As a mother, hi everybody. Hello. <laughs> I was married at the age of 20, and over the next 10 years, wanting family and being a good Catholic, I had six children. <laughs> My first daughter died a few hours after she was born, but I went on to have five more children. Two sons, one daughter, and two more sons, Dennis, Kevin, Karen, Scott, and Craig. There was not much money for a family of five children. To support them, after Craig was born, I started working for UNIVAC a computer manufacturer, and I started as a controller. Since Univac paid employee college tuition, I went back to college as a nighttime student and received my computer science degree. Soon after I graduated, Univac offered me a job as a programmer on their latest product line, and I was included in a small group of new pro programmers Univac sent to MIT for six weeks to learn systems programming. For the benefit of my children and myself, I left my husband and took my five children with me, and Craig was only three and a half years old. Being a single parent and sole supporter, I believe that Jesus and Mary would help us survive. We started a whole new way of building our lives, not only as a family, but a cohesive group of six friends who had to live, love, and work together. Being the mom, I was the leader. I wanted my children to grow up to be respectful, strong, independent, responsible, and helpful, good individuals. This would not have happened if I had stayed with my husband. I found a great child psychologist who helped us all understand the life changes we were going through as a family and as individuals. We saw Grace once a week, and she was a godsend for all of us. During weekdays, I had someone help me with Craig as he started kindergarten. But on the whole, Dennis and Karen, my troopers, took command of handling and helping and taking care of the younger children while I was at work, night school, or studying. My younger sister Susan and best friend worked with me at UNIVAC. She lived in an apartment close by and we were really a family of seven. On weekdays, we spent cleaning the house and playing. But weekends were our time and Saturday was the cleanup day and cook day, but Sundays, we took our car rides and went to all different places. For example, we didn't live far from Valley Forge, which was one of our favorite haunts. We worked together to pack a lunch, grab some books, a radio, some balls, and we took off to have a good time. We would dance, play, eat, and drink, and do and read all among the trees. When we were ready to leave, we would get in my big convertible, old, 
and we would drive around on the park roads. I would stop and call a fireman's drill, and all the kids would climb out with their friends, which they were mostly there also, would climb out of the car and run around the car laughing while I honked the horn, and bystanders would clap and cheer them on as they climbed back into the car and I would drive off. As the children grew, everything was not all fun and roses. When there were tough times, we would all sit together to talk out our problems, differences, and troubles, and make decisions that would work for all of us. There were rules that needed to be followed, and certain reprimands for rules that were not followed. I hate to say that Kevin was really my greatest challenge. He was definitely that second child, always finding out a way to be different or disruptive. They were all really respectful and understanding of my times away from home with work and college. Sometimes Karen would squawk. I wasn't a Donna Reed kind of mother who stayed at home and baked cookies. And my answer to her was usually, do you want shoes on your feet and bacon to eat, or do you just want cookies? <laughs> on the whole, they were a great bunch of kids who got along well with their peers and themselves and were very smart in school. Thank you, God. When Jesus was starting college, I got the opportunity to move and work in California Bay Area. Grace suggested Kevin should stay in Pennsylvania and go to a military school she knew. It would give him more of a structured life and help him to get into the Army, which is what he wanted. She also obtained financial help for me so I could afford the school. This meant I left for California with three children, Karen, Craig, and Scott. Craig was just nine years old. We settled in Cupertino and I worked in Sunnyvale, the Silicon Valley, and San Francisco. The change from Pennsylvania seemed to be really good for all of us. Karen accepted California very quickly and started high school making lots of good friends except for the football coach. He called one day and asked that I please have her stop helping the football team in practice. All 90 pounds of her had broken the collarbones of two boys by butting her head in tackle moves. <laughs> Scott loved the sun, the pool, baseball, golf, California outdoors. He forgot Pennsylvania very fast, even though he was the one who didn't want to move. He has always been an extremely serious and quietly forceful person. He wanted to be a baseball player and was a pitcher for the Cupertino High when he was in a California State Baseball competition but this was not to be his future due to a bad wrist injury. Craig's best friend was a motherless brown kitten he found in a vacant lot nearby. Sometimes he would disappear and we would not be able to find him. About a week later, I sent Craig to the store and while he was gone, there was scratching on the door. I opened the door to find a little brown kitten. And while I was wondering how it made up the stairs and why it was by our door, Craig came back from the store. He admitted he had been taking food to the kitten in the lot because he didn't know we could have a cat. He named this big, beautiful, brown sable cat Waco, who lived with us for 19 years. Beyond the cat, Craig loved cars, collecting auto magazines, drawing, and computers. And that was ever since he was seven years old. After college, Dennis joined us in California. He worked in a bank which was robbed, and he decided that was not for him. He obtained a position at Stanford University and moved up to head administrator, working for the university president and four other department heads. After many Stanford years, he joined the Responses organization, which is a computer company, and he became the manager of the programming personnel who controlled various San Francisco airport airline reservation computers. Dennis and his partner of 32 years lived in Vallejo when in 2013, Desmond passed away from cancer at the age of 55. Sorry. Karen graduated high school at 16 and had enough of school and wanted to get a job and start earning money. She was only 16, but she was a queen bee among her four brothers, and she learned early how to work with men. She had spent most of her, she had spent most of her life working for automobile organizations and has been very successful as a service department manager. She even married for a while and wanted a child very badly, but had six miscarriages. Before Dennis introduced her to a Stanford doctor who helped her, and she has a son, Joey. Mm -hmm. Scott, after graduation, was determined to pay his own way through college while working. 
He did this and became an engineer for FMC of Bradley Tate Fames. That's Scott. He married the high school girlfriend, Lori, at the age of 19. The reverend said to him, or said to me, Scott was the oldest young person he ever married. They are still married and have two children, Thomas and Sarah Faye. Kevin in high school was an impressive carpenter, Inwood class, which served him well after the Army. He learned the construction trade and started a company refurbishing homes. He moved to the Bay Area to be closer to the family and he built single family homes. He met and married Peggy and they moved to Flint, Michigan, where her family lived. I'm sure he would still probably be living in Flint except for the recession, which drove him back to the Bay Area and he doesn't live far from Scott. I am sure most of you know Craig, especially with his face, who is not just my son, but my best friend, and as a child was the most fun. Craig was an excellent school student, and after high school went to college for architectural design. Besides his love for cars, he also loved helping people and worked as a, in a variety of sales and retail positions. Retail gets old, and he went into the computer profession. He did this because it was easy for him since he had used, played, torn apart, and put back together computers and other electronic equipment from the time he moved to California. He is now a successful computer professional. I believe my children have become successful. Individuals, because I always, with God's help, worked and taught them to be respectful, strong, independent, responsible, and helpful individuals. Thank you. On my own, what I have to give doesn't amount to much in the light of all that you have given me and in the face of so much need. Put together as a congregation, what we offer you here in love becomes more, not simply added together, but somehow multiplied in its usefulness. We ask you to bless our gifts and with the addition of your blessing, just as it was with the loaves and the fishes, there is enough for all. Amen. Amen. given to us from Jesus using the words most comforting and familiar to you saying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of sending in the United States.